Hello, people. Uh, uh, so uh, today I'll be talking on how to build low latency decentralized infrastructure for gaming RTC, like possibly anything, keeping it decentralized and low latency at the same time. It sounds impossible, but maybe we have one idea which can be maybe replicated across domains and that's why I want to like get into our system architecture and hopefully there is someone who sees value in the architecture and maybe that can be replicated across domains. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I am an engineer at Hardlow One. I've been working on uh, distributed systems and uh, optimizing WebRTC for low latency for the past three and a half years. Um, okay, let's get started. What is WebRTC? WebRTC is a suite of protocols, like it's not one protocol, it's like five protocols which are stacked together on top of each other. You'll see IPv4 on top of UDP, TCP, on top of ICE, TAN, TURN, these are a lot of words, DTLS, SRTP, codec, whatever. whatever. Uh, you will also see a made like a made like a demarcation. Uh, the one on the right is called a data channel, which is what a lib P2P transport uses. So WebRTC is actually like a transport which has like two modes. One is a media channel, which is time critical. So if you're in a video call, you're using the media channel because you want to receive video at the lowest latency possible. And the other one is the data channel which you can use to like send and receive files directly from each other. Now, why does the data channel exist and why does the media channel exist? So for that, I can get into the history of WebRTC. Now, this is actually really cool. So it was 2010 and uh, Google Chrome had 6% of the global market share of browsers. And these were like the era of browser was. And what did people go to the internet for? It was AOL, it was people talking to each other. They went to meet other people. Uh, yes, so Google decided to do something about it. Now, communications at that time were using like patented codecs, hidden protocols which you didn't know about, so Google just went and bought them out and open sourced all of them. <laughs> so Global IP Solutions was a company which uh, provided RTC infrastructure for AOL, WebEx, Yahoo Messenger, if uh, you all remember. So all of those clients were served for by Global IP Solutions. Google just bought it and open sourced all of their code. Uh, Google, and that time like video codecs were really uh, really expensive to engineer, design, and do research for, so they were all patented. Uh, Google bought another video compression company called Onto, and their codecs for the VP8, the VP series of codecs, so VP1, 2, to 8, and now we've got VP9, to compete with the 8 series uh, video codecs, which is like H.264, H.265, AV1, etc. So Google wanted to bring video conferencing and uh, media communication directly into the browser so that there was enough reason for people to switch to Chrome uh, from the Internet Explorer. And that led to them uh, creating what we today know of as WebRTC. Um, WebRTC, the goal of WebRTC was to be like a peer-to-peer -peer protocol which did not inherently need a server. So if, let's say, I was talking to B5, then we would not need a middleman to talk to each other. And in those days, video like video calls or normal calls would just be like one-on-one -on -one or two people, maybe three people in the room. So a peer-to-peer -peer connection just worked fine. Um, okay, why am I talking about WebRTC? And this is a gaming track. So I think, uh, there are four major points which I think have dropped parallel seriously with gaming, uh, multiplayer gaming mostly. Uh, connection round trip times have to be less than 100 milliseconds. 
uh, if it's more than 100 milliseconds, the, the quality of communication is just not that great. It does not feel snappy in real time. Uh, packet loss is bad, uh, very bad. Uh, if you get packet loss in like real time communication, what has to happen is you're supposed to send like a whole new frame. Uh, the coder, the codec has to reset. The decoder and coders have to reset. So you're really optimizing for not dropping packets at all. And this, I think, also draws parallels to multiplayer gaming. When let's say you're playing CS:GO, uh, any CS:GO fans in the room? Uh, okay. <laughs> so. Uh, when you're just playing and then you lose internet for a second and you die, it's frustrating. So packet loss is very bad. Uh, it's time critical. Time critical is uh, time critical meaning like if you're doing a download, downloads aren't really time critical. Like old if let's say you lose a packet, you don't drop it, you can request an ACK and receive it back, then you order them. But in case of video conferencing, if you're getting a video frame which is like two seconds old, you really don't need it. So you would drop it. So it's time critical and it's similar in gaming where everything is very time critical. And the last point is synchronicity. So everything has to be in sync. Game states have to be in sync. Your media states have to be in sync. Your coder, codecs have to be in sync. Uh, and that's how I think uh, gaming does relate a bit and drops parallels to WebRTC. Um, scaling issues with P2P WebRTC media. So WebRTC was designed with the thought of enabling serverless, uh, serverless is wrong, peer-to-peer -peer communications directly with a few people. But uh, as you'll see, if there are five to six people on a call, then every independent peer has to manage independent connections with everyone. Just orchestrating this whole mess is a chaos. Compared to now what we have is a thing called a centralized SFU. So what that does is uh, it aggregate, it, it's like a central entity for people to connect to and then it just routes media to different people. So people just have to maintain one media transport or one WebRTC transport and all media flows through that. So no need for having to manage so many connections. Uh, yeah, and connectivity issues with WebRTC peer-to-peer. -peer. So I've created a diagram now. This was the thing I was making like that. By the way, um, if this doesn't make sense, the the rhombus you see is a peer. There are two people, one in Canada, one in the USA, and they are trying to talk peer-to-peer -peer with each other. Now, what you see are public network hops. So if a packet is going from me to the person in Canada, uh, then it has to go through these public network hops and let's say that's one, two, three, four, five. So uh, it's totally gone over four public network hops. And what you really want to do is uh, in real time communication, minimize the number of steps your packet has to take to reach its destination. Um, and that comes to border gateway protocols. So if the person in Canada and the person in the US are using two different ISPs. ISPs try and keep their packets, uh, they don't want the packet to leave their ISP BGP because then that adds that's, that add-ons to latency. But when you're using public hops because it's the internet, you really have no control over how the data moves. And that is what is solved by cascading. So. We spoke about the centralized SFU which exists. Now, uh, the solution to this is, let's say now you're even, you've gone even further. You've got people in India and you've got people in the US. You want them to talk to each other, but you want the minimal, the hops to be minimal. So what you do is you've got central SFUs in the US, in India, across the globe and they optimize for the lowest latency paths. So for example, uh, if uh, that media SFU is on GCP, for example, or if that's on a bare metal server or a bare metal network, and the other media node is on a bare metal network, both of them share metadata to find the lowest, uh, the shortest path possible. They try their best not to leave the border gateway protocols. So for example, if both of them are on GCP, the 
the protocol will try and find people on the same providers in order to minimize the number of public network hops which you have to take. So imagine if it's from the US to India, is directly, the packet is coming from one hop directly from the suboceanic fibers directly to there. So there's no public hops involved. And that is what uh, will protect you from packet loss. Uh, hair pinning. So uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with hair pinning, hair pinning is basically if two people are on the local network, have a bar TC versus negotiates with public IPs. So there is a scenario where your packet can actually leave your network, go to the internet and then come back, but you don't want that uh, when people are in the local area network. So cascading really prevents all of that. Um, okay, so what is the media node? So we did talk about the SFU. A media node is just a wrapper around the SFU and these are worker nodes. So uh, worker nodes mean like people, like these are dumb servers, like I learned this word yesterday. These are dumb servers which can be programmed by people who want to orchestrate them in the way they want. I'll come more on this uh, regarding what that means. So uh, boot up, uh, media node just boots up, starts the media engine and it uploads the capabilities and metadata. Capabilities refers to which codecs it can serve. Metadata refers to which uh, cloud provider it is in if it's an if if it's on a cloud provider uh, which bare metal service it's on and it tries to share all of its private uh, private IP public IP so that uh, during negotiations we know uh, during cascading we know what is the best the lowest hops connection which we can be we can be making um, it connects, it advertises itself to a P2P network, which we call the registry network, with all of its capabilities and metadata. We'll come on the registry next. And uh, orchestrator. So a media node waits for the instructions from an orchestrator network. Quality of service, uh, okay, we'll go on that. So there is a, so there is a reputation system, which is also part of the protocol to, because people can permissionly, permissionlessly add, uh, like spin up a media node, there has to be a reputation system to maintain, okay, how much load should go to a media node? If it's working properly, you give it more load. If it's not, then you slash it. So for that, we've got a QoS module. Um, so what is the registry? It's a lip P2P network of, uh, it's a lip P2P network which manages the DRTC network infrastructure. So it is a, it is a, consistent hash table. Uh, so if a media node wants to register onto the registry, the registry maintains the list of all media nodes and their metadata. And that is a publicly queryable data set for demand. So for example, if I want to talk to people, uh, I want to like select two media nodes, then I can just query the registry network. It'll do computations to see which has enough empty, uh, which has less load and then it'll return the query back and then I can directly talk to those media servers. So the global data store in which all of this is stored uh, is built on top of Go DS CRDT, uh, which in itself has like three parts, which is the global data store where you can, which you can select anything. We use Badger in our implementation. The DAG sync can also be anything. We use ITFS Lite and gossip sub can be lip p2p or something else and we just use uh, lip p2p for gossip okay now comes to orchestration so i spoke about why media servers have to be dumb servers and this is the reason so media communication can really vary depending on the use case you're trying to provide so webrtc is used for both video conferencing, but it's also used for low latency live streaming from the source, which is less than 100 milliseconds compared to what we have today, which is HLS, which is minimum 15 to 30 seconds of latency. So for that, uh, orchestrators or uh, people who are building on top of the network really need freedom to piece media nodes together to form their own scaling solution. So in case of a CDN, what you would have is you would have one streamer streaming to one SFU and then fanning out the stream. Um, in case of a distributed conference or a voice chat, you would have a few SFUs and then Alice would connect to the closest SFU 
uh, which he can find. A uh, Bob will connect to the closest SFU he can find, and both of these SFUs will try to connect with the lowest number of network hops. So that is why orchestration is really open, and people building on top of Huddle's network can bring in their own orchestrators, uh, maybe a live streaming orchestrator, or a video conferencing orchestrator, or a gaming orchestrator. We default, so the our SDKs are built on our orchestrator implementation called Sushi. Uh, Sushi. Uh, it's, it's because it's socket server, so the S comes from there. Uh, so we create WebSocket connections with the client, and then the client, nego uh, we do the signaling through the orchestrator, and the client directly connects to the media server via WebRTC. Hmm, so that is that. Now, how does all of this relate with gaming? Uh, I'll come back to the previous slide. Yes, here. So um, in multiplayer gaming, you'll see that servers are really local, but because you need to have consistent states. So for example, if A, B, C, and D, E, F were playing a multiplayer game, the server would have to maintain central states for the locations and positions of ABC and also take care of conflict resolution, who fired the gun first, who fired it later. So in gaming, maybe having a, a dumb server or a central entity which can be orchestrated uh, really helps. And then trying to scale it across across platforms can help. So we have been so this infrastructure i talked about has been empowering our platform and our sdks for the past two years now and we've crossed across four million uh, user minutes and seventy-five thousand meetings including live streamings and we are going to soon launch the media node which people can readily host um, if they've got enough bandwidth and yeah i think that's it thank you